All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined by Dom Melly, who is in Parramatta outside Sydney in Australia. How are you doing, Dom? Yeah, good, John, good. Yeah, and Dom is from the company People at Their Best, helping people and organizations perform at their best. It's a self-explanatory name. And, uh, and what Dom wants to talk about today, and I think this is an ex exceptionally good subject, is the future 21st century leadership and leading in volatile and uncertain times. Now, it would be great if we had volatile and uncertain times to be able to test out some of these theories. <laughs> but... Uh, Joking apart, obviously these are these are volatile and uncertain times of of the of which you know none of us have ever lived through before, and I don't think most of us have ever had you know lived through a, a globally collective experience like this. But so um, so Dom, what are some of the unique leadership challenges that we're facing right now and probably going forward because things are I mean yes the pandemic is going to go but the changes that it's brought about are probably going to have long-term ramifications it's such a big a big question John it's the right place to start isn't it I mean what are the challenges look I think the cliche here is that everyone talks about accelerated change and I don't actually think that change is the issue here. It's the uncertainty of that change. It's, it's the fact that we've moved into a complex environment, which is very diff different to a complicated uh, environment where things are evolving in very unpredictable ways and where there's no one right answer anymore. And, and that makes decision making and taking action when you're not sure of the outcome, that makes that incredibly difficult. And you can't be certain anymore that the action that you're taking is the right uh, action. In fact, I'd say it's even more than that. I'd say that there is no one right action. So that idea that there's a problem that needs to be fixed and that we take action, even that has become a pretty redundant concept. Uh, and, and we talk now about interventions which make progress towards a, a future state that you desire. And that's a very different concept, that idea of taking action, interventions, making progress towards a better state, uh, rather than the idea of fixing a problem. And that's because, as I say, what defines time now, apart from the accelerated change, is, is just the extraordinary complexity, the unpredictability, the volatility of the time where you can't be certain that the act, there is no one right action that you can take for situations. So solutions have become, you know, they, they lose their relevance very quickly. And, uh, and, and any solution that you might put in place degrades and decays very quickly. So it's, it's quite an extraordinary time that we're in. And that is different. I mean, yeah. as we've come out of the industrial and the information age, we've really moved to this concept or connected time. And, uh, and that's that's a real movement away from a linear or complicated world to a very complex, organic, volatile, uncertain world. So, yeah, and and I could, I could talk about this all day. <laughs> yeah, no, which is great. Uh, and and I think part of the problem, as you as you underlined there perfectly, is the uncertainty and the fact is that uh, it's really hard to plan right now. I mean, once upon a time, yeah, I remember, remember back in those days when people had five-year plans and then it went down to three year and then it kind of went down and it was kind of like planning for the next year. Now people are in 30, 60, 90 day planning modes. To your point is because there is so much uncertainty that to do anything else is, is, is futile and redundant and in, in many ways. Um, but it's really this sense of uncertainty that paralyzes a lot of people. Absolutely, John. Yeah. In fact, even even the concept of whether it's a 30 day plan or a 60, mm -hmm. 90 day plan, even that can be a psychological handbrake because people become wedded to the strategy. Sure. And, and the one thing that we know is that adaptability or agility, there's plenty of buzzwords out there being nimble, is far more important than the, than the strategy itself. So I think coming back to that leadership uh, notion is how does a leader cultivate adaptability within the workforce or within you know, their team? And that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. But the one thing that we absolutely know, and there's plenty of longitudinal studies that have examined this, 
is that the characteristic that's mo most closely correlated with high performance is adaptability. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and without getting too theoretical about it, it, it really comes back to Charles Darwin, who said that it's not the biggest, it's not the strongest, it's not the smartest that flourish, but it's those that are able to adapt more easily to changes in the environment. So when you've got that amplified change environment, who's going to be able to change quickest, uh, to learn from the environment and take action to better meet those challenges or the needs of the market. And that's, that's, a, that's, that's a real shift. You know, that's a yeah. shift that we've seen in the last decade, really, where adaptability has become the key characteristic, which, to be honest, should be the attention that leaders are giving. And, uh, yeah. and, and we don't see that that is their main focus or where they're putting their attention and energy. It's in other areas, and I understand why, but it's, it's not as useful or as helpful as, as cultivating that adaptability. And, and the part of the part of the problem or the I think the problem with people have with adaptability is you have to create the number one, you have to create the environment for that. But also to be adaptable, you've also got to be comfortable with getting it wrong and quickly pivoting or quickly or quickly moving or, or adjusting or whatever. And that that that's a really that's a big psychological change to be comfortable with getting it wrong and then quickly changing again. Yep, absolutely. And look, it's part of that same pivot that we were talking about before or shift where leadership used to be about controlling, you know, and it used to be about making sure that things were done correctly. Now it's much more about making sure that you do the right things rather than doing things right. And that idea of control, of stability, of even scale has been replaced by speed and, and cultivating that safe environment where people are safe to fail and to test and to learn and to adapt. That, that's really difficult. And a lot of organizations say that, you know, they're cultivating the right environment for innovation and for, for, for um, piloting new, new ideas, but um, that's not the experience that we're actually seeing. And most people are still operating under an old model, which simply doesn't work anymore. I mean, John, just that shift, and you know, this, this isn't saying anything that isn't known quite broadly, but that shift away from material consumption to creating an experience which customers value, which they find meaningful and they're willing to pay for, they value it. That's such a shift in the operating model for most businesses, you know, to create an experience. And then to really understand that the value of their operation resides in the experience which is created and which is valued by the customer. And that, that movement away from value residing in the product or the service to value mm -hmm. residing in the in the experience it's created that that's a that's a radical shift to the operating model of most organizations yeah and we see so many examples of that i mean obviously we've seen the you know the global success of amazon who have just made that and and especially here in the states where they continue to make that experience to where you can get things delivered in one day you can get grow yep. you can get it but they have made the they have made the whole fulfillment process so easy and so simple that you're that it's almost it, to say the, to say it's a great experience, it's almost no experience, right? It's almost uh, you look, can take I, it for granted, right? And, and and who am I down here in Australia to to criticise you know that the behemoth and the success mm -hmm. that they've had? But I, I'm I'm 100% agree with what you're saying that it's almost no experience. And when you look at what are the domains of a truly meaningful experience, you know that that resembles much more of a transaction to me than a than an experience and. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that, that's, that's yeah. my opinion. But what we do know is that the organization, I mean, in future organizations will compete on customer experience, you know, mm -hmm. not on the product and the quality yeah. of the product. So that's just a given, you know, so I'm not discounting the need that people need to have a world-class product or service. That just gets you a ticket to play. Yeah, and I think that, that I think that that is the important thing is that largely yeah. in the eyes of consumers, um, whether in B two B or B two C, products are largely commoditized, and it is really the experience and it's the attachment to the brand. And it's like I said on the Amazon side, it's about it's just simplicity. That's what people want, so they go for that. On other things, um, you know, and, they and John, want to. Sorry, John, if I could just interrupt. Yeah. yeah. In a world where everything now can be copied, uh, yeah. when everything can be replicated and everything is being automated, that's still a race to the bottom, you know? So if someone else comes up with a way to get the product there in the same way, in the same time 
time frame and can do it for a, you know, a buck cheaper, then people will move to that. So, you know, when people compare like with like, you know, they'll invariably buy on price. And, and that's, what, that's what we'll see, you know, that, that'll be copied, that'll be replicated by someone mm -hmm. else and people will shift their allegiances. So the value has to reside in something more than just the product, you know, and the transaction yeah, yeah. that takes place, yeah. No, for sure. And like I, and I was saying, then when you get into other um, products and services, it is very much it is very much the experience, uh, as you say. It's very much what you build around that, and that's something that that's something that people are still learning to do. But there's one thing I just wanted to come back on, kind of that you touched on earlier, is that, as you say, we, we're in this we're in this connected world now. We're in this digital world. And everything, and and obviously the pandemic has accelerated the move to digital, but a lot of a lot of thinking is still very analog. So <laughs> while we're moving there, it's the, like people are still thinking in very analog ways. Companies are operating in very analog ways. So there's a there's a bit of a, a, a friction there. Oh, <laughs> absolutely, and I think I I alluded to that um, a moment ago yeah. that. The operating model of most organizations mm -hmm. that we see, I'm not saying everyone's like this, is still an operating model that's straight out of the industrial era or the information era, where the value resided in that product. Uh, and they haven't made the shift, that pivot to value residing in the experience. And, and, and that's a really difficult shift for people to make. Having said that, John, given that so much is being automated, I think that makes and this is the good news part of, of my story. Yeah. It makes those remaining human interactions so much more valuable. Mm. So the organizations that are able to demonstrate those human behaviors, which can't be automated. And I'm talking about making people feel valued or empathy yeah. or making sense of a complex world. Those are the three areas that haven't been automated yet can't be automated and are integral to building trust. And, mm -hmm. and you know better than I that, you know, people will tend to buy more from the people they trust. So the human interactions which aren't being automated are where people should be putting their energy. And that's really around empathy, making people feel valued and making sense of the complexity uh, that, that's around all of us. And at this moment, machines can't demonstrate empathy, only humans can. So that's a really good news story. And that's where we should be putting our attention. Yeah, no, I, 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 no, I totally agree with you there, and I think that is that is the good news because yeah, it it elevates the kind of of interactions that you need to have, and also, I mean, and it's it, it, this was happening anyway. I think there was a bit of a backlash about everything being so heavily automated, and you know, with companies making it almost impossible to speak with them because <laughs> all of that. I think there was this there was a pushback against that anyway. I think the the pandemic has just accelerated that where people want to have some meaningful human interaction. It, it means something, it, and it probably means something more now than it ever has. So if you're, if you're ignoring that and you're not looking, as you say, you're not looking at the parts of your, your process that cannot be automated, that technology can't solve for you uh, to elevate that experience, then you're missing out. Yeah, and I think it's when you try to use technology not to augment the human experience, but to replace <laughs> the human experience. I mm -hmm. think that's where, you know, you're on, a, that's a race to the bottom. And, mm -hmm. and the pandemic has accelerated that now where people do need to connect with another human being. I mean, we are social animals. So until machines find a way to demonstrate empathy and make other people feel valued and understood, then, uh, you know, there's, there's still room for people to really flourish. There's still room for us to differentiate ourselves from other businesses and to create that experience, which people value, you know, and, and that, that's where I think organizations will compete in future and more and more so, and it's, it's happening right now. P part of that shift, John, just while I think of it is what can leaders do um, to, cultivate that and and one of the things that we touched on a moment ago about experimentation which is so critical is that they have to create that psychologically safe environment and i think that's mm -hmm. something that has to be far more conscious than it currently is i don't think many organizations set out to create a psychologically safe environment where people can actually be themselves use their skills take risks suggest different ideas 
uh, and are encouraged to do so, make mistakes without fear of punishment. That, that's a really unique environment. And when you get that right, you see innovation flourish. Mm -hmm. You also see uh, employees or workforces that are able to connect more easily or more effectively with their customer and their market. Yeah, and it, and it's not. I mean, and and I agree with you. And uh, but at the same time, I mean, recognizing that it's not the easiest thing to do if you're maybe a small organization or you're trying to grow and all of that. It's really hard. Yeah, I mean, you can look at big companies. You know, your uh, ones that it's great and they able to be all free and let people experiment. But you do. I totally agree with you. You do have to move move in that direction. But it is definitely a massive challenge for smaller organisations to do that without kind of without without imploding. <laughs> Absolutely. And and if I could suggest something, what leaders can do to help that is to. We find that organisations tend to overinvest in their strategy and in defining goals and underinvest in aligning people to the organization's purpose. Mm. You know, and one of the mega trends that is happening all around the world is the shift from profit to purpose. And the organizations that are doing better in competitive or challenging environments are the ones where everyone is aligned to that common purpose. And it's so, you know, it's so intuitive, it makes such sense, doesn't it, that if everyone's driving and working to fulfill the same purpose, then you don't get that dysfunction or the waste of resources or those false starts. It's so important that organizations invest more in defining their purpose and then the leaders spend the majority of their time trying to get that alignment. I think alignment's the most urgent organizational issue today. And what we find is that there's organizations that have that single lens through which they take the action that they take, navigate these types of crisis periods far more effectively because you don't have that waste of resources. Everyone's working towards the same end. And, and I think that organizations underinvest in that. And the second part of that is that they underinvest in making it crystal clear what is required of the workforce to fulfill that purpose and to deliver that value promise to the market. You know, so they overinvest in strategy and goals and underinvest in the purpose, aligning people to the purpose and defining what it is that the workforce needs to do frequently and consistently day in, day out to better deliver on that purpose. Yeah, I, know, I, I totally agree with you. And I'm just writing a note here. It's just clarity. And I think that is that is clarity and focus, I think, are the two things that tend to be lacking because what happens is as you say i mean you can come up with the strategy you can even say like, here's our purpose and, and all of that and everybody goes yeah that sounds great but then as you say never go down the next level and actually explain how the, you're going to deliver it and what part are is everybody going to play and all of that and have clear you know um have a have a, a clear way of operating toward and getting towards that goal um and and uh, and that's what I think. Uh, that's where it falls apart a lot of the times. And I think that's the problem is a lot of organisations they hear something like that. Oh, you know, let's be a purpose driven company. So they think, okay, how do we become a purpose driven company? Let's come up with a purpose, okay, and then let's put it on T-shirts and have it at everybody's desk. And then, but there's no connection between that and actually what the company is doing or how it operates on a daily basis or what it even delivers. Well, it's even worse than that, John. When, when we surveyed uh, leaders of organisations here, more than 80% of them felt that the workforce understood what the chief goals and objectives were. But when we actually talked to the workforce themselves, less than 2% had any clue what they were. So one, I don't think that goals drive behaviour, but more mm -hmm. importantly, they don't even know what they are. It's yeah. much more effective to talk about behaviour. What do you want your workforce to be doing frequently and consistently? And that has a far better link to behavior that's exhibited. And as I said, delivering on your value promise to the market, that's far more important. To, to quote one of your um, countrymen, Tom Peters, who I've met a number of times and you know, is, is I think the best thinker in this space. And, and Tom's done so much research around this, but when you look at what are those factors which contribute to the success of any organization, whether it's a startup, whether it's a sporting team, a not-for-profit or a multinational global company, you know, no more than 15% comes down to um, 
to the strategy. Less than 20% comes down to your systems and platforms. And those things are regarded as threshold domains. Of course, you've got to have them. Of course, they've got to be robust and in place. But beyond being in place, they really don't contribute much to success. So they're threshold domains. Get them in place, get them right. But then your success is going to come down to your people, 65%. And, and that's, you know, how aligned, how committed, how engaged, how passionate are they about the purpose? And then do they actually have the skills and capability to deliver on that purpose? Mm-hmm. And, and that's 65%. So if we're talking about growth, if we're talking about how to maximize profit, invest more in your people. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones that have got to execute that strategy. They're the ones that have got to use those systems and platforms. You know, and if you get the culture right, they'll overcome any problems that you have with those. I always like to talk about uh, Mike Tyson, who said the strategy is only good until the first yeah. time that you get punched in the face. Yeah. You know, and but but more seriously, the military here and and some of my colleagues in my team uh, are, are ex-military, and they say, you know, the strategic plan is good for the first five minutes of battle, yeah. and then what's important is how committed are they, how engaged are they. You know, how how well how they? well trained are they? And do they have the skills? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, the thirty five percent. Are they enabled to actually deliver on the mission or purpose? And thirty yeah. percent is you know the, that commitment, engagement, passion, or engagement with the purpose. Yeah, uh, I've 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 talked to I've talked to a number of uh, of people here who have like intense combat experience and special operations and all of that, and they do they say the same thing. They say, yeah, we we have plans. And we do scenario, you know, play out scenarios for things. But when it happens, most of that stuff goes out the window and you fall back on your training and executing on, on your, the skill set, as you said. And I think that, to your point, is a very, very good one. I think today, particularly because of the uncertainty, particularly because of the fact that you have to be nimble and adaptable and all of that, the skills of the people are so are so critical because otherwise otherwise it's, you're just never going to be able to do that. You're never going to be able to be flexible and adaptable if you don't have highly skilled people. There's a rule. It's a ten six two rule, and that for every ten percent improvement in engagement, there's a six percent increase in effort, and a two percent improvement in all financial metrics. Now, there's nothing more that there's nothing more important than getting people engaged and making sure they have the skills to actually deliver on your promise to the market. To, to quote Tom Peters again, you know, get the execution right, get the culture right, make sure the people have the skills to deliver, and pretty much any strategy will get you there. And in fact, like I was saying before, the strategy is pretty irrelevant when things change so quickly. So the strategy that you come up with, you know, decays really quickly. It's just not fit for purpose anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah. that's a key characteristic of a complex environment, that solutions are not fit for purpose. You know, if anything, it's a psychological handbrake where people become wedded to the strategy and don't move quick enough away from threats or towards opportunities. Mm-hmm. And yeah. part of that is, and, and this is where it's so important, we talked about adaptability. I think that's you know the, the key characteristic. And we also talked about uh, alignment for purpose. The other one in all of that is resilience. Yes. And that idea that you can respond effectively rather than just simply react blindly, that, that's not something that's in you know pl- plentiful supply at the moment. Most people are just doing the same things and hoping that they get a different result, you know? And, and that, that's the characteristic of resilience and emotional intelligence that you actually take contextually appropriate responses that are effective for that environment rather than simply revert to familiar patterns of behavior, which uh, another one of your great thinkers from North America, I'm sure you know, Daniel Kahneman said that, mm-hmm. who actually proved that you know, we're not rational, that when we're faced with challenges, we revert to familiar patterns of behavior, even though it's harmful to us. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's why it's so, and, and that's why we see people like it's so difficult when people, you know, have destructive behaviors in their life, right? You know, that it's so hard to overcome that because they do serve a purpose and they are uncomfortable yeah. even when they're harmful. Same thing in work, even when you know they, even when people know that they aren't aren't um, applicable to this situation, they will still use them because they're comfortable. They're comfortable, and what they're actually doing, John, is mistaking that for rational. It feels mm-hmm. rational. It feels logic logical. Because, you know, and the, 
physiology is this, is that you don't have to expend the same amount of cognitive resources to come up with a new way to behave. You know, mm -hmm. you just do something that's efficient, you get it done, it's just not effective. So you're not yeah. expending the same sort of neurological energy to do so. And, uh, you know, and that, that's, a, that's a real neurological handbrake for us. It's, it's, <laughs> a, it's, you know, it's a mistake that we make. It's a limitation on the human yeah. brain it's simply trying to do things efficiently. And it can't deal with the mass of information that's being bombarded for all of us every day. You know, where there's so much yeah. information that needs to be assimilated and processed. The brain takes shortcuts. Yeah. So being able to stand above that and be highly conscious and, and deeply curious and, and to, to think about what is the environment telling you and to take action that's appropriate for the context, that's difficult. It's really difficult when you're trying to make a buck. Yeah. No, listen, fantastic. And that's a great way, I think, to, to round this out here. It was great. Uh, uh, highly conscious, uh, highly adaptable. Uh, I, I love that. And I think... Uh, that's a great takeaway for everybody. All of Dom's information will be below this video, but before we go, Dom, do you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself and your company? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, John, um, because I talked about purpose, our purpose is to help everyone to be at their best, you know, to, to help organizations to increase their internal capability to match their external ambition. That's what we say is our purpose, which means helping everyone to be a little bit better. And we love working with smart people and helping them become great leaders and helping organizations to flourish. So that, that, that's what we do. And, um, and it's, it, that is our purpose. And we get such a lot of energy and drive from helping organizations to improve themselves and, and to move towards that vision that they have or that desired future state. And, and that, that's what gets us up in the morning and excites us and, and keeps us highly motivated. And I think when you're, when you're doing that, when you're aligning yourself with your purpose, I'm not saying that that's the answer to everything, but you give yourself a better shot of surviving these difficult times that we're all in. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, and a great, great, great purpose to have uh, helping people be their best. Uh, couldn't really yeah. get better than that. All right, my name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.